Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, for the sake of also for to leave time to the presenters, I think we're going to get started uh, as people keep coming over. Quick reminder before we get started, as you might have noticed yesterday as well, when you stand up, the seats make a lot of noise, unfortunately. So when you stand up, please turn and make sure that the seat behind you doesn't slam. Otherwise, like not only here, but like also back home, people are just going to hear things slamming around. And I don't think it's very pleasant for anyone. So thank you very much for coming today um, about this integrated analysis and triangulation of data in DHIS. Um, it's a session that we have also tried to bring forward last year, but um, it's still very relevant as, as countries move towards an integrated platform for analysis to try to like showcase more and more examples of, of triangulation of data. I, I am Victoria. I work at the University of Oslo in the health content team, and uh, um, I'm trying to bring to you a, a short introduction just to give you an idea of uh, why we think that is very relevant to continue discussing triangulation and the, the use of DHS as an integrated platform for data analysis. So before we actually start talking triangulation, uh, we need to understand what is an HMIS. And an HMIS, it's, it's, it's a place, uh, if you don't want to call it platform, if you don't want to call it, it depends also on the, on the tools that you use, but let's call it a place for now, just to uh, use very concrete word. It's a place that brings data together from the health facilities and other sources. Uh, it's used for decision making at multiple levels. That's the beauty. You need to have access to data at point of care as much as at national level. And DHS allows you to do it at all the different levels of, uh, of, of administrative levels. Um, it generates and supports the analysis. Uh, so you can have your indicators at hand and you can start monitoring your indicators accordingly. And of course, the, the structure needs to usually represent uh, the administrative levels to support processes and uh, workflows and data flows, of course. And all the things put together should allow you to uh, create evidence-based policies, evidence-based actions, and opera. opera operations, oh, I just gave up on the word, and, uh, and operations that should actually bring you to um, database uh, actions. So you will need to start putting all the pieces together, and you see it here. Um, it's a, it, the HRS itself can serve as a platform to integrate all the different health programs, because health programs alone uh, uh, mean virtually nothing. And you need to start putting all the little bricks together in order to build your HMIS. You have your routine data from health facilities or the community, of course, but you also need to start having like facility information. You need to start having population data. You need to start having your CRVS, so vital events, uh, uh, civil registers, as much as logistic, finance, HR. Your services don't work if you don't have a picture of who works in your facility facilities and such. So you see that the, the, the scenario, like the landscape is complex, but it's necessary to start integrating all the information accordingly. And these data also serve different purposes. You see that same landscape also can inform individual data, but it can also inform aggregate data. And it's also proportional to the in type of information that you might need. As a frontline worker, I might want to have access to individual data to better understand who are my patients, how am I scheduling them, who is coming to to, to attend my services and whatnot. But at higher levels, that when you are talking more a strategic level, at operational level, they might not want to know if John Smith arrived yesterday for the vaccination, but they might want to know why I'm having a dropout that is at that degree. So you see also that the use of these data when they are integrated in one single platform that allows you to connect these numbers is very important at, at analytic level. And uh, the, these routine data that I was telling you earlier, of course, we have plenty of examples. We have like um, global guidelines on these, but um, it, at the end of the day is to have like timely evidence and, allow, and to have data that uh, is, is shared among the different programs and among the right people in order to make these decisions. And, uh, and of course, this might sound scary, but 
like a, I mean, you all know the book, like a, um, that the a man is not an island in the end. But programs are also not an island. You cannot have a standalone program that doesn't talk to other programs. Why? Because your your HR is needed for surveys for for your for your um, TB programs, for your HIV programs. But as much as your IPD register is not a standalone, because that IPD register might have a, a someone that has been hospitalized for malaria, or you might have someone that has just the Delivered. And that person that has just delivered, you need to uh, inform your CRVS that just that person just had a baby. So you will see that all the programs are, all the programs are so interconnected that it would be illogical to think that every single program is an island that doesn't communicate with the other type of information that you find across in your HMIS. Wait. Okay. So once you start having all your information together, you might want to start triangulating this information to prove whether the data are good or just to see what can we do together to improve the situation and to make sure that operations are acting accordingly to the information that the actual routine data are giving us. So we try to understand uh, the different actions and the interplay between the different programs. So to have a more comprehensive understanding, but also to have like an holistic approach when it comes to decision-making that is not just for the program itself, but that can benefit other programs and can benefit other type of activities as well. Oh, sorry. And with the HRS, you can do different ways of triangulating, not just with the HRS, but of course, here we are the conference for DHS, so therefore DHS. Um, and uh, you might have programmatic triangulation, so different have programs and they can overlap, they can show you the gaps, but you might also have like temporal triangulation. So over different time periods, what is going on and uh, how are we finding challenges? How, how are we seeing gaps? And of course, we also have spatial types of triangulations that you can do. So you can start using the beautiful maps that also Scott was showing us yesterday and you start using them for the purpose of identifying where our gaps are, our barriers are and where things are working fine and trying to understand why things are working fine there, for example. And of course, I don't think I have to tell you the benefits of triangulating and, and integrating all this type of information, but still you see them here. The, and these are just a few of the benefits that you might have. Of course, you start monitoring better, uh, you, you start collaborating better also when it comes in countries where different partners are, are, are moving things around. You need to start collaborating, you need to start talking to each other to avoid duplication of efforts as well. And these you can do when you start having one single platform that brings the, those data in front of stakeholders as well. Of course, this is not all easy. <laughs> it's, it's also, there are also challenges, like for example, data quality issue, the integration in the sense, purely technical integration, the uh, activities that need to be done in order to have all these data in one single place. There might be resource constraints when it comes also to uh, hardware, as much as like people working on this. But of course, there are also solutions and strategies that can actually help you overcome these type of challenges. Um, before I introduce the speakers, just so you know, like a uh, part of the of the the work in uh, in the in the health team, uh, we also try to uh, publish as much as possible global toolkits, but also best practices when it comes to triangulation. So, in case you're more interested in more type of information of the tools and and uh, and the toolkits that are out there to support your your work, there is also an expert lounge uh, on Wednesday at uh, at four p.m. And it's in this auditorium, actually, as a matter of fact. So if you, if you want to know more, you're more than welcome to join us. And uh, without further ado, today we have four speakers. Um, you see that there is like a, quite a variety of topics, but because we wanted to span to also very different type of information, because we want to show you that there are activities out there already being done, and you can do triangulation with virtually anything that is relevant for your for your activities. So uh, I will do like a, a quick overview right now because like that we don't lose time between the speakers. So we have uh, Dr. Dr. Keshab that is a senior researcher at the Karolinska Institute and is going to show us a little bit about their work on triangulation between TB and HIV. Um, 
Keisha, but also like I remember a few years ago also presented some uh, a beautiful presentation about their um, HIV tracker. So the quality of the work that they carry out, especially in Nepal, when it comes to analysis uh, and triangulation is particularly advanced as a matter of fact. So I really invite you to pay close attention and, uh, and ask questions as well, because Really, the quality is really high. Then we have OTS as well uh, from the Ministry of, of Health of Zimbabwe. And uh, it's about enhancing malaria elimination, which is incredibly relevant for probably at least 60% of the people here sitting with us. And, uh, and we also have Rajab. Uh, from the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, and it's about um, parasitological surveys. And we did it also on purpose because malaria, again, standalone doesn't exist if you don't start acting upon par parasites and other activities to control them. And finally, we also have Stefano, uh, who works with me at, uh, at the university, but um, we also thought that it would have been a really good opportunity to show you more information about the um, health facility attributes. If you don't know what they are, no worries, we're going to explain it, and how you can start triangulating them with, uh, with uh, health data to improve your, your activities and uh, the, the landscape of, uh, of your services. So thank you so much, and I'll leave, uh, and I'll leave the, the microphone to Dr. Kishan. Thank you. I need to just click this one, right? Here? Yes, you can use the uh -huh. mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for coming. And um, my name is uh, Kesab Deuba. And thank you so much for a nice introduction, Victoria. And today I'm going to present on behalf of my co-authors. One is uh, Mr. Lokraj Pandey. He's uh, working for National HIV Program. And another one is uh, Dr. Sarat Sarma. He used to work for the National Tuberculosis Program. So today my presentation is about how can we use DSIS to tracker while planning, designing, and implementing health facility data, uh, you know, health facility-based survey or research. And I'll, I'll share uh, my experience of using DHS to track our data using in uh, planning our HIV drug resistance survey and also for the uh, TB survey. And this is my presentation outline, as I have explained. Like, uh, the, I'll present briefly about how to use these routine health facility data and then uh, benefits of using these routine health facility data. Uh, using DSS to tracker for efficient planning and implementation of uh, the surveys. And also, uh, I'll show you uh, different examples uh, to use in different phases of those surveys. And uh, while uh, like designing and implementing, we, uh, as, as usual, we also face uh, different challenges. And I'll, I'll also share about like how to overcome those uh, challenges. Uh, most of you are expert, but still I'm going to uh, read out these slides uh, because sometimes in real world we forget it, you know, the, how to use these recorded data in tracker. So data from the routine health facilities are gathered at the clinics, hospitals, and other health service points, including public, private, community-based, anyone who is implementing services at the, uh, at the time the services are implemented, uh, uh, provided to the clients or our patient. So these collected data are usually, you know, uh, analyzed, and managed, and reported to the higher authority in different formats, mostly in aggregated formats to the higher authorities, uh, which we usually uh, call it like health management information system. So these health information system are essential for tracking progress toward health-related targets, which is prioritized by local, provincial, or the federal government health strategies, or the global priorities like uh, sustainable development goals and others. So uh, routine health facility data are extensively utilized for national and subnational health sector reviews, planning, areas like immunizations, tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV programs. And in any health programs, we use these routine health facility data. So one of the key examples of 
uh, using routine health facility data is uh, doing you know regular or periodic surveys to monitor key health indicators either related to diagnosis or treatment or evaluating the effectiveness of interventions or you can if if you want to evaluate the quality of your service uh, delivery so i'm going to explain you uh, different phases of the survey for example uh, in surveys and resource activities uh, some of the key activities that are really time consuming and costly are one is about development of sampling frame uh, which means like you have you need to have a list of you know all eligible patients or clients which are taking services from your health facilities so in most of the low and middle income countries like nepal uh, developing a sampling frame is even more challenging due to you know unavailability of your target population details and this often resulting from existing social stigma discrimination or criminalization of certain behaviors or disease status. And this issue is further fueled by, you know, lack of unavailability of online system. And uh, most of them also use paper-based recording registers. Even if they use, uh, they must sometimes report uh, data in aggregated manners to the higher authority. And so you can't, you know, utilize those aggregated numbers to design and implement, or uh, if you need individual level data to plan your survey and research, those things, uh, limit your uh, planning and use. So uh, even like just to develop sampling frame, you know, a study team needs to hire professional, provide them with the research specific training and mobilize them, and which incurs both time and financial burden, as most of you know. So another major, you know, the activity of survey and research, uh, for like any research, not only for health facility uh, related based research, is to random selection of the your patients so that you can generate your unbiased estimate or the selection of your health facilities so that everyone who is eligible, like the patient or clients, should have equal chance to be participate in the survey. So that's the another uh, key activity of survey and research. So another third one is the most time consuming and bothersome is related to collecting accurate and complete information from the study populations through various uh, methods. Most time we use face-to-face inter face -face interviews or biological sample collection for laboratory testing. So just to address these key phases of survey, so I'm going to share with you how we use or supported our, uh, especially the acquired HIV drug resistance survey in HIV program, and how we utilize uh, the DHIS to track our recorded system. Since in our country, we already have, like as Victoria explained, the HIV program is using uh, this uh, tracker system in all HIV treatment sites. Uh, that's why we were able to use uh, the information data recorded into the system. So regarding target details, for example, in our survey, we need you know two types of information. One is about like how many people living with HIV who are on treatment for at least nine to 15 months. And others like how many of them are on treatment for at least 48 months. And similarly, we also needed, you know, the in total health facility in Nepal, how many are like operational for at least 48 months or how many of them are operational for at least less than 48 months and each those health facility we usually categorize them as a cluster in resource so how many like uh, our eligible target populations are taking treatment from those uh, health facilities so these are the two informations for this what we did is uh, since we are we, we were using the tracker and to generate the required informations so we you know, guided our field team or health workers who are working at the, each health facility who are providing treatment to the uh, people living with HIV. We requested and we guided them how you can download the required data so that we can generate our sampling frame, let's say for uh, like client code and also the age and gender and the date of treatment initiations. And, and, but while like, you know, downloading and sharing with us, we requested them to how to remove the personal identifiers like name, mobile number, GIS locations, so that we can use those informations. And based on those provided informations, we develop complete you know, sampling frame for each health facility that uh, we, were select we selected for our survey. And the key variables we use were like date of enrollment in HIV treatment, current HIV treatment status, so that we can identify our target population. So also for like health facility details about like, you know, the eligible health facilities since we know uh, from the also from the tracker, their establishment years since uh, when they first provided their services to their first uh, patient, 
And based on that, we easily categorize like which uh, health facility is operational for at least you know 48 months or which is operational for less than 48 months. And, and based on those two like we informations, uh, we used you know, uh, in our methods to stage cluster sampling since we already have list of sampling frame of each health facility. And then we selected our health facility using probability proportional to size since we already, we also knew from the system recorded in tracker like how many eligible individuals are uh, uh, eligible for our survey within each uh, selected cluster. So we selected uh, the health facility and then also uh, in the second stage, since we already have like all the client details by client code, so we you know randomly selected all eligible PLSIV on our uh, survey. So based on that, following that process, what we did is we uh, like the central team managed to identify selected the HIV treatment centers, twenty treatment centers among total, and we also randomly selected fourteen hundred eighteen PLSIV without even reaching to the each health facility in person. So it means, so it's, it ensure avoided bias, you randomly selected, and it also provided you information so that you can you know, share with the health workers uh, to schedule their appointments for further assessment of their informations. Then after like getting all these informations, then we provided uh, training to health workers from the those selected health facility only on how to collect additional informations, which are not in the tracker system, like uh, collecting their uh, plasma samples and, and or uh, testing for the viral load. And if someone is like uh, unsuppressed viral load and submitting that samples to the further genotyping to assist uh, drug resistance. And the central team also provided them randomly selected clients uh, go to the each health facility. Okay, these are the patients. You need to uh, you know re, uh, inform them about their available time so that they can come to the health facility, visit health facility, to provide a biological sample. So in our like uh, survey, we used to have, you know, we have to collect two types of information. One is about patient level data, which means from uh, like uh, their age, gender, data, first treatment, ART initiation, current ART line, first line regimen. So this is one type of, another one is biological data. As I informed, we need to test for their uh, 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 drug resistance. So what it helped like DHS to track our recording information system, we can extract their social demographic information you know, from the patient since already there. So you don't have to ask again the patients to just to assess their, uh, the patient level data. And it's also eliminated, eliminated need to develop an app. You know, Usually in our survey, we need to develop app. And then if you don't able to develop app, you print hard copies of questionnaire and you carry with them to the field, sometimes you, you know, there's a chance you lost uh, your collected data during, you know, traveling and transportations. So those all hassles were also, you know, eliminated by using the DHS to track our recorded data. And uh, and also like, uh, it was like most efficient, uh, you know, methods for the central team, who, those who are managing this type of survey research. If there is anything missing information of selected uh, patient, we also inform health facility. You can also side by side also improve the, you know, quality of your uh, or completeness of data recorded in the GSS tracker. It also helps survey plus side by side also uh, improve the completeness and quality of your uh, recorded data. So other advantage as well. Sometimes while calculating sample size, designing your survey research, uh, the the tracker recorded data also provide you parameters so that you can also use those parameters to calculate sample size. And based on this process, we successfully completed the you know, first uh, drug resistance survey in Nepal uh, using the DHS2 tracker. And then uh, we you know, reported these findings to improve our program, also finding to the global platforms, also to WHO. We, uh, the same steps while planning and designing TV survey, so we also try to use replicated, uh, replicate the same steps uh, like uh, developing sampling frame. And uh, since the TV program is also using the uh, this tracker in individual recorded data, but it's not always easy, you know, to use a DSIS to tracker data to, you know, plan and design and support your survey research because some of the limitations barriers are like, 
not all health facilities are using trackers due to remote hilly areas or mountainous areas they don't have it started because of the lack of infrastructure computer internet or those things and as I, as I informed, like not all you know, required information are recorded even within the DSIS2 tracker. And what third most important thing, what we uh, found lacking is that uh, there is like lack of comprehensive guidelines, like how to use DSIS2 tracker, you know, data to you know, develop sampling frame, how to randomly select, and how to uh, support the whole process. Because even if what I realized while working in the, you know, the routine programs, Though we are using tracker to uh, in our routine health facilities, we most of the time forget while you know planning and designing health facility based research, and we think uh, you know plan in a traditional way like you know developing separate uh, questionnaire and then again printing it or training it or developing app based questionnaire. So the, though it's the system is there, sometimes we miss to use the available system to support our research activities. So that's the uh, third most important thing, like I also, you know, uh, found during designing and implementing our activity, the, but what we did in our solution is like, if, you know, uh, the data in tracker is not complete, then we requested our field team to validate with the paper-based registers. So whatever is data available in the tracker, we request them to validate with the paper-based registers, then make a complete sampling frame so that we can randomly select the eligible uh, patient or client. Uh, that's the same mixed method means either use, if some health facility are not using tracker, means you go there, you make prepare a sampling frame. If others are using and it's complete, means you download from the tracker and make a sampling frame. So we can follow either both ways. And it also support, you know, we can also analyze the quality of data recorded in tracker. If we use for the research purposes, then we also analyze, okay, why these key information are missing from the uh, tracker. And we, uh, to support this process, we also like develop uh, guidelines, like how to, you know, develop sampling frame, how to download the required information uh, from the, the tracker and how to randomly select those uh, selected uh, from the sampling frame, how to select our patient. Uh, it's uh, close to conclusion. So it's, it's the, from our experience, DHIS2 tracker enhances methodological rigor because it saves our time and it also saves our resources in terms of cost effectiveness. And it also, you know, the health workers can schedule the uh, patient uh, whenever they have time, they have to come to the health facility, not in our time, like the time of the researcher. And those advantages really, you know, save your time and resources. So uh, my key recommendations uh, to the DHIS2 core team to also you know, develop uh, the guidelines, like how can we use uh, the DHIS2 tracker to uh, design or plan or uh, implement our health facility-based research in future so that we can you know, more use in a standard way. Because if you provide like some one of the few, add few more tools within the tracker, like, okay, now we have, these are the list of our eligible patient and, or client. And if there is like some tools to randomly select those, you know, patients so that we can do everything within the DHIS2 tracker or by downloading data separately and to support our activities. So main impact is like, you know, we can monitor and achieve global health targets because uh, it can give you like where our status is and how our treatment is working or not, whether our interventions is effective or not, it's like Viteria mentioned. We can also identify which are the patients are least performing patient who are like, you know, not performing well in the treatment. So these all, uh, you know, targets and uh, status help us to monitor our key indicators or uh, targets of, uh, prioritized by our strategic plan at the national level or the uh, global level, like uh, sustainable development goals. And these are the resources, references, and thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Kesha. Thank you. Um, let me, can you help me out? <laughs> Thank you again. If you having questions, start ruminating on them. We might have time for a quick Q&A at the end of the session, so. Start thinking. Thank you so much, Kishav. Okay.
Test. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Why? Okay, I'm Tafmani Watias with the Minister of Health working under the National Malaria Control Program. So I'm going to give you a presentation on leveraging DHIS 2 for enhanced malaria elimination strategies in Zimbabwe. They, that, that is harnessing climate, environmental, and health data integration. So this is my presentation outline with the introduction. Um, looking at malaria surveillance in Zimbabwe, integrating uh, case management, factor control, and climate data for comprehensive malaria surveillance. Then uh, the number two is factor control measures that are implemented in the country. Uh, we have enhanced malaria surveillance, uh, focusing also on MND for IRS and ITNs. Then uh, number three, I have uh, malaria case management and investigation in Zimbabwe. The country is divided into two strata. We have got the control, then we've got the elimination. So it means to say we, we, we actually understand both the control side and also the elimination side. So for that one, it's also focusing in terms of elimination. Then the issue of integrating now the climate data uh, using the DHIS2. <clears throat> so as I once alluded, um, this is the, the data flow and, and the feedback loop that we use in the country. Uh, first of all, what we should simply take note of is cases are mostly reported at community level of which we are looking at cases that are coming from, from the village level. If we are to look within the most African countries, uh, you actually note that equity is, is, is not there. So in most cases, you'd actually find out that uh, those who are poor are mostly affected by diseases and malaria is not an exception. Therefore, there is need to look in terms of equity so that we actually try and improve in terms of disease burden. Because currently, as it stands, we'd actually find out most people in the rural areas are the mostly affected people. Therefore, there is need to address that. So cases are reported both at the youth facility and at community, of which we use uh, village youth workers to try and uh, assist or help youth facilities so that they don't get overwhelmed and also for patients to get access to treatment as soon as possible as they get affected by the disease. So we use the two, both the health facility and also the community. Then within the community also, we also use the village health workers again to assist in terms of endomological surveillance. That is in terms of looking at breeding sites or areas where malaria can actually, where mosquito can actually breed. So we also use the community health workers to assist. At the same time, also we've got uh, environmental health technicians or officers who work at health facilities, who work hand in hand with the community health workers. And in terms of uh, the implement, uh, the, 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 the areas that we target in terms of implementation, I, I have once alluded in terms of vector control, we've got IRIs, of which what we've already done is a country we've tried to include the data or for IRS into DHIS2, and currently as a country, that's our uh, data repository that we use for, for uh, that's DHIS2. We've also tried to do the same for the ITNs. We have also included them into, into the DHIS2. At the same time, in high building dis districts, we give IPTP as a way of trying to uh, improve the health status of our pregnant mothers, right? So... <clears throat> as a way of trying to make sure our, all the data is kept in one repository. We have uh, 
included all the data in DHIS2. Therefore, in terms of data flow, we are saying we've got community, we've got health facility, but all the data is captured into the DHIS2. So we have people at facilities who, who actually do the, the, the paper-based system, then they submit to the district for capturing to the DHIS2, thus for both a aggregate and case-based. So from there, it's kept, it's kept into the DHIS2 and access is available for everyone who has got access rights at all levels. Meaning to say, in terms of our data now, for us to actually utilize the data that is in the system, we rely on both the, the, the community and also the road facility. At facility level, also, as I once alluded, we also have got the EHTs who are capturing the data using the DHIS2 tracker app. That's in the elimination settings. Meaning to say all cases that are recorded in elimination settings are tracked, investigated, both the cases and also doing the conduct tracing plus endomological investigation is done by the EHTs. Meaning to say we have all the data uh, of cases within the elimination settings by individual. Therefore, all cases that have been conducted trust, we have to make sure we check on the breeding sites, we investigate the breeding sites to ascertain where the problem is actually ca coming from. And the geocodes are actually taken to make sure we know where exactly the problem is actually coming from. Then in terms of the intervention that are actually taken, okay, so in terms of the inter intervention that are actually taken, once a breeding site has been identified, we do a, 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 a level assembling. We also actually also do the um, the, 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 the um, a mosquito. We also do the um, a mosquito. Okay, okay, that's fine. So it, it's it's, to, it's on the next slide. So in terms of uh, <clears throat> trying to actually utilize the the climate data which we are collecting, and also the data in terms of malaria, linking these two together, what we have also done is, as a way of trying to make sure these two actually interlink, we have tried to come up also with a system whereby we are also doing the data investigation using the DHIS2 as a way of tracking. So we identify all areas where we actually have got challenges or problems in terms of malaria, so that we actually know where most of the deaths are actually coming from. That's why I've also actually uh, talked about the issue of EPT to say this is mostly affecting a uh, poor rural areas. That's where we're actually mostly getting our deaths. So the, the map that is showing a uh, death audit in Manical and province where we've got high number of malaria deaths and it's mostly affecting uh, border areas, border lining areas with Mozambique and other countries. So what we've actually noted is in those areas, rainfall patterns are actually quite poor. At times, uh, they've got low rainfall patterns, but at the same time also, the temperatures are also high, meaning to say in terms of breeding, in terms of breeding of, of mosquito is quite high, thereby it, it's actually affecting most of our communities and that's where we are actually having more deaths. Then again, we've also noted again, uh, in terms of uh, immunological surveillance, we have also noted that um, where we have we have got confirmed uh, resistance of Arabians, more malaria cases are actually high. And if you actually also take note, it's almost again in the same area if we are to take Manika land as, as one of the provinces where we have actually have high number of malaria deaths and also high number of malaria cases. And we actually also noted the uh, confirmed resistance of Arabians in those areas. Then we also tried also to try and let us say, even though our indoor residual spring is quite high, because if you actually take note, we've got high deaths that's where we've got high resistance of Arabians. That's where we had also high uh, IRS coverages. Though it's high, but it's true. We have got the challenges of deaths. We still have got the challenges of resistance of mosquito. 
then we, in terms of resistance of chemicals, then we also have got IRS coverage. So if you try to interlink these three, you can actually see that, of course, something is amiss. What really is actually the, the problem? We have got high IRS coverages, but still we have got high deaths, and also the issue of resistance, meaning to say, our best can actually try and help our communities so that they are not affected by malaria. Then, to looking uh, at, at malaria, looking at, at the 137, that's within the elimination settings, we have actually noted that where we have high local cases, both what to do is, as we do an uh, investigation, we make sure we have to classify all the cases. Are they local? Are they imported? That is in terms of the cases that have been reported. So once the cases are actually local, that's where we also have got high malaria deaths and also high malaria cases, of which through the investigation that are actually being done, we, would actually, we have actually noted that these districts where we have got high local cases, is we have got also high breeding size that have been noted. Meaning to say, in terms of fossa investigation, it needs to be enhanced and also improved so that we reduce the breeding size in the area if we are to achieve zero local cases in the areas. As we tried to triangulate our data to see uh, in terms of the if impact or effects of climate change, what we have noted is we took one of the districts, which is closer also to Zambia, where we have actually noted that uh, for the period 2016 to the period 20, actually up to 2024, we have noted that where we had high rainfall patterns, cases were also high. Where we had low rainfall patterns, cases of malaria were low. And this we have actually noted is a pattern from 2016 to 2024. As it stands, uh, during the period 2023, as an example, we noted that the same district, it had high number of malaria deaths. Again, similar to what we have also noted, where we had high uh, uh, IRS coverage, but still we noted also that Cases continue to be high, meaning to say there is um, a distortion in terms of why cases are, are high, where we still have got high IRS coverages. Meaning to say there is need to look in terms of how best can actually try and protect our communities. Should we give them double protection, that is IRS and also ITNs, of which, according to the country's uh, CC vector control regulations, we cannot uh, give double protection, meaning to say we have to rely on one. Either we use ITNs or we use IRS. But that's one of the recommendations that we actually noted is actually of importance. Meaning to say this is an interlinkage between climate change and high malaria cases. We've got high rainfalls. We noted that also malaria cases are high, where we have got low rainfall, malaria cases are sometimes low, but it also depends again with the behavior patterns of the population. And also the issue of equid, both in urban areas we actually find out there is no malaria, but it's two times we actually find out high rainfall patterns are actually there, and still no, they don't use ITNs, they don't they, 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 they don't do IRS, but still, we have more cases. Meaning today, the issue of equity needs also to be looked at. So as, as a district that I have once talked about, the same district, which is Binga, the prediction that we have also noted, in 2023, as we try to, to, to forecast in terms of malaria cases, it actually came out that in 2020, after every about two years, there is a steep increase in terms of malaria cases. And this is a pattern that we have noted, even at national level, it's, it's affecting most of the district. After every two years, the third year, 
we actually see an increase in terms of malaria cases. So it's something that is worrisome and that also needs to, to, to be digged deep into considering the issue of climate change and also malaria. So as, as a recommendation, what we have recommended uh, as a country, we are recommending the upscaling of use, or use of climate data by integrating it into, into DHIS2. As it stands as of now, these are two separate. We are simply relying on the data that we get from the meteorological station, but it's not integrated into DHIS2. But if once we have also have gotten up so that we can collect that data routinely, so that we can actually easily interlink the relationship that actually exists between the two, that is climate change and also in uh, the, the, the malaria is, 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 is a disease burden in the country. Then integration of diverse data sources supports comprehensive understanding of malaria dynamics is quite critical also. Then uh, we continue to use the DHIS2 as a powerful tool in terms of malaria and uh, uh, in finance in Zimbabwe as a country. We continue to use that one. I think this should be my last slide. I have tried to make sure uh, it's in graphical so that it's easily understandable. I thank you. Thank you, Tears. Um, this was unbelievably inspiring, uh, not to mention the fact that I'm sure that Scott was very happy about the use of maps. Um, <laughs> no, um, this is just one example of like the possibilities and the degree to which you can actually start integrating different sources and different types of information for your uh, for your programs, for the management of your programs, and most importantly, to have uh, evidence to really start directing your resources where the needs are are needed the most. So thank you so much again, Otis. It was outstanding. Thank you. And now, Rajab. Thank you. Hi, still morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay, my name is uh, Rajab Mkomwa. I'm, I'm not a, a doctor, I'm a software developer, but I will try to be epidemiological today. So I'm from University of Dar es Salaam. I will be uh, sort of presenting the, the use of uh, Android capture in uh, supporting the implementation of school mal malaria parasitological survey. Uh, so basically, I will be talking around the, the SMPS uh, survey and how we sort of uh, customize the DHS2 to, to support the survey and the challenges around it. So just to, to, to quick start, uh, as a background, uh, uh, Tanzania mainland is actually transitioning from uh, moderate to, to low malaria transmission. Of course, this is, this is the general aspect, but of course, within the country, we, we have sort of uh, a stratum uh, that are ranging from very low to high. So you'll find some areas that have high malaria prevalences, but in general, we have really transitioned uh, equivalent from 14 prevalent percentage up to 8%. So of course, this has, made me, has been made possible around a uh, couple of uh, interventions that are based on epidemiological stratification, as I said, the low, uh, very low and high, and around the intervention like ITNs, IRIS, LSM, etc. But uh, this uh, kind of uh, deciding what interventions to do is really governed by the data from HMIS that are cases that are from health facility, but also some of the data from household survey. So uh, NMCP has been using the Tanzania Demographic Health Survey, uh, household survey and malaria indicator survey to sort of establish uh, that stratification. But uh, oh, they noted that actually the the large household survey are, are, are pretty expensive as they involve larger sample size and, and sort of to, to find another way of actually doing a cost-effective survey. Now they are come by uh, seeing into looking to school malaria parasitological survey. So the, the rationale to select the school survey is based on the population data 
uh, that, that shows around 30% are school attending students, uh, which are ranging from age of five to 16. And uh, based on the enrollment rate within the schools, yeah, so it, it, it feels like the school survey could be much more cost effective and cover a large chunk of population uh, sample size. So basically the, the school malaria survey uh, was just an approach to close that gap of, of expanding the, the, the aspect of, of survey and it aimed to determine prevalence of malaria among primary schools, also to establish a spatial and temporal uh, risk of all, plasmodium plasparum transmission uh, around the, 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 the malaria endemic cancels. Also determine the use of insecticide net. So during the survey, also the, the, the question around uh, the availability of nets uh, in the community. Oh, so the study was a cross-sectional survey, which collects information from primary student HD children, school HD children, also from head teachers and thereby to household. Uh, so the sampling aspect was done, as I said earlier, the uh, Tanzania NMCP tried to stratify the country into four stratum. So they selected the words in each of the stratum and thereby also they selected schools, primary schools from those words in each of those stratum so that to widen the, the scope of the survey. And of course the sample size around was uh, something like 65,000 uh, school attending children with 10% around of number of households to be surveyed. Um, so uh, basically the, the, the SMPS uh, starts with collecting information about school, uh, uh, coordinates of the school, number of students. Of course, as we used the, the, the DHS to capture, some of the details were auto-generated like school ID to be used later. And also there uh, from the selected student within a school, at least around a sample size of uh, 10, 100 to 120, then uh, they take the lab sample uh, and test the student within the school. So this part was also captured within the process, but again, after taking the sample, the student were uh, interviewed uh, around malaria knowledge, household status, lab result, etc. And there, 10% of the sampled, the tested ones were now, uh, the, the, the team visited their households to more like collect more information around household members, economic status, and also mosquito net details. Uh, but again, then the next process was just the data management, extraction of data, cleanup, and interpretation, which actually arise to some of the uh, outputs. And in the end, the one, one of the output is, uh, is malaria prevalence, a school prevalence, which actually is used uh, in generating the stratification map, which is also used in, in other intervention like RIS, LSM, et cetera. So this pretty much summarizes the, the process of oh, SMPS. So uh, the SMPS started out some while back. Uh, initially, it was paper-based in some cases. They used epidata after collecting data from the um, community and then feed it into epidata. Also they use Excel for checking and also strata for analysis and QJS. But later on, uh, of course the, the 2017 is also based on the 2015, but later on they sort of switched it to ODK. Now some of the paper form except tool two, which is a lab based uh, form where we are collected using the ODK and, and the same, the, the statistician, we are used with uh, Strata, QJS, so they continue with that. So now in 2023, that is where we replaced the ODK now with the DHS2. But based on most of the statisticians still are used to these statistical tools like Strata and uh, QJS, they still wanted to to use 
the starter, but also the tool two, also they wanted to still collect it uh, in a hard copy, which later on uh, was filled within the system for, uh, for quality checks. So this is a little bit of a timeline on the uh, SMPS. So on the aspect of using the Android capture, yeah, so um, malaria, NMCP Tanzania has established what we call malaria composite management information system. So that, uh, so a DHS2 platform that encompasses other non-routine data, so, uh, ranging from parasitological survey, entomological, uh, parasitemia, vector control, all of the interventions are actually collected within the, what we call CMIS. So they also wanted to utilize the same to collect the SMPS data. So of course we undergone some um, stakeholders meeting to analyze the requirement. Also we sort of customized the tool within the, the DHS2 and use the DHS2 capture to collect. So the tool was around, we have, they, they are putting a tool in terms of tool one, tool two as the steps I as highlighted. So the tools were, were designed some tools three and four are designed as tracker, some are designed as event, and of course, yeah, some are like tool two was later also designed as tracker to capture the information after the field work. So we did a training uh, for like three training session across three zones in the country, and also the training involved with some national supervisors, regional district, and also education officers. So we, we had uh, head teachers who also were collecting the data through the uh, Android capture. Yeah, so <laughs> my challenges are really based on a technical aspect of the, the Android capture as when it comes to the use in the survey based uh, uh, setting. So of course we, we face some challenges around unfamiliarity of DHS2 terminologies. Most people who, uh, you, you, you can see at the school teachers who are really not health oriented, really couldn't catch most of the terminologies, but some, uh, the application had two, two, two small font size. I think this for Android team. So it wasn't really, easy to, to read out. Uh, also, there are some aspects that uh, when you're doing survey, you ought to collect information around fa about health facility. So one of the requirements was to, to know the, the nearby health facility to the school. So the system has both the schools and the health facility hierarchy, but you want to be able to only select health facility. So the, the community hierarchy wasn't able to provide such thing, but also there was this concept on capturing or on auto capturing the coordinate. Unfortunately, the tool or the capture wants you to hit capture the coordinate, but just they wanted, if you open up a form, the coordinate will automatically be captured. But also there is aspect on this survey tool was mostly like interview kind of tool. So when you start an interview, they would want to capture the time automatically. And then when you end the interview, they would want to, to, to capture the time that you ended the interview. So you are sure how much time you have taken during the interview. So this was also an issue and many more that are highlighted here. I may not be able to go through over them, but just to highlight some of the key ones also, uh, when we designed the household tool within the DHS tool, we were forced to use program stages when collecting information about household members. You know, you have one student uh, who goes to, to his or her house and you have to collect information about the members that are in the house. So for for instance, if you say you have four members in the house, you, you, you have to be able to collect four events because we, ha we were forced to use a uh, now program stage to have that in one tracker program. So there are some aspects on, on limiting the number of, 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 of events. Also, there are some aspects on when you collect the household members and when you are uh, recording the, the, the net details, you also have to say, how many people have slept in this net. So you have to also link up the household members 
and the number of uh, on the net that you are recording. So there are a couple of uh, tricks around the, the, the system that uh, were challenging. So some of the uh, mitigation that we had tried to do to ensure that the, the Android capture can at least still be used, at least uh, in a way. So we tried to, uh, we cloned the, the capture app and we try to sort of uh, add some few functionality to just enable it to be used uh, in the survey. So we, we also needed to have in each household members you are recording, you need to provide a unique number to a household member, which is based on program stage. So given the fact that the, the capture is not, the, the, the program stage does not support auto-generating the unique ID, so we, we had to sort of tries to do that ourselves within the, the cloned version. Also, there's this aspect when you are collecting information about household and you, are, you have to relate it to the net information the, the member has slept on. So you or in the net, net, net information, you have to say one, two, three members have maybe slept in this net. So we also had to cross, create a cross-relational aspect on the stage around um, household member in the stage around uh, the night. So also that is what we, we, we have tried to, to do. So I think this is a calling uh, for the core team to think on a better approach, perhaps uh, auto-generation of all unique ideas around the program stages, also that kind of relationship around the two different stages by using maybe data from this stage to another stage. So this will... Uh, what we first and it tries to solve. Uh, so uh, 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 despite all those challenges, we were also able to record the responses. So the projected sample size was 65,000. We managed to, to collect such from uh, that school, the, those 715 schools. And also we were, they were able to visit 6,618 uh, households. And of course, this also paved their way on other survey or intervention based implementation around SMP and MCP. And we managed also to configure the lava source management tools. And we, 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 we sort of piloted in one of the region across Tanzania. So uh, thank you for listening. On behalf of my colleagues, I thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, now I'll ask Stefano if you can come over. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Great. So thank you very much, Victoria, for the opportunity on the on the, this presentation. So what we are going to what I'm going to present today is uh, how we can. Uh, so first of all, I will describe what are these uh, famous health facility attributes. This is something that we already presented um, last years, and uh, how we can use this uh, with an integrated analysis with the data coming from the HMIS. So first of all. As I said, what are these health facility attributes? So very clearly, these uh, are semi-permanent data about facilities. So for example, uh, the key information related with the number of staff, uh, type of services that are provided, uh, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of providing an ID of our health, uh, of our health facilities. Normally, this information uh, can come from different sources. Okay, normally this information are not collected in the HMIS, even if we would like to, but it can come from different uh, platforms or other different uh, um, different tools that can be used. And this information are very key information that can be used for uh, to provide to the policymakers and um, at national, at district level, an idea about availability, accessibility of specific services. 
So as I said before, so we can have information related with availability of uh, or provision of various or specific type of uh, services, uh, availability of key uh, equipment and social medicine infrastructures, uh, IPC availability of training uh, of training staff uh, pos by positions and uh, how these information are collected. So normally this information can be collected with uh, tools that are already pre-existing. For example, here an example of the uh, HHFA, that is the uh, tool that provided by the WHO, the Harmonized Health Facility uh, Assessment, but it's not a comprehensive collection of, uh, of these attributes because normally these are surveys are carried out every three, five uh, years in the countries. Uh, and uh, it's not systematic for all the health facilities. So we are missing the information. It's just to provide a kind of a snapshot of uh, kind of how, the, what is the situation in the country, but it doesn't provide a, a specific information of each of the health facilities. We can have uh, other tools like the IRAMS. So the IRAMS is, is a initiative as well led by the WHO the, that the uh, IRAMS stay for health resources and service availability monitoring systems. And as well here is a collection of uh, key information. Normally this tool is used more in emergency settings, uh, but really to be able to determine if, okay, uh, which uh, health facilities are open, uh, what are the services that are disrupted. So we saw that this information can come from different uh, services. As Victoria was saying at the beginning during the presentation, uh, this health facility attributes, uh, we try to integrate it in a global toolkit, a global DHS2 toolkit is called the health facility profile. So what we try to do is uh, gather uh, some international standards that we're taking from the HHFA and uh, other experience that we gather from uh, Uganda, other organization, and try to create a, a kind of global toolkit that can be used and adapted. So. Don't, I don't want to enter into details, but the information are divided by two different uh, major groups, healthcare system accessibility and then healthcare system preparedness according to the type of information that uh, are going to be collected. What is very, very key, what is very, very important is where this information is going to be stored and how this information can be used. So uh, this information said can be very scattered, can be collected by different tools uh, and the use can be very um, can be very silenced. What can be a very strength of this type of information is the possibility to integrate it with the routine health management information system. Because at this moment, then we are able to triangulate and to use this information to inform other programs, to inform uh, national programs, to try to understand, okay, where do we have gaps? what can we do and how we can distribute more uh, better the uh, the type of services that we are uh, that we are providing as well improve access etc cetera, etc cetera. so the most important things that we normally always say let's start from the output let's start from the outcome so why these are important how we can analyze this type of information what information are going to provide us so can help on the plan of the resources of allocations, can identify bottlenecks and accessibility issues, can prepare as well to respond to specific health emergency, being able to know where are located our services, where is located our uh, human resources staff, uh, can help us uh, in uh, on all the preparation and response to specific uh, um, health emergency situations. So. One type of analysis that we can have, very basic, uh, collecting this type of information is the availability of services. Try to understand, okay, we have, um, for example, here is coming from the rehab, uh, rehab toolkits. Uh, where do we have uh, these services? Where are distributed? Do, are we covering uh, enough all the populations? We can go even other example like uh, human resources. Where do we have these human resources? Uh, where are located? Where are specific position of these uh, human resources? Can have, sometimes you can have uh, gaps on some specific areas. Uh, and uh, as well, then we can triangulate uh, different type of information within uh, these health facility attributes. So trying to understand, okay, where do we have the services? Uh, but where do we have the services? Do we have the correct stuff? And do we have the equipment? as well on this, because we can say that we have, uh, for example, an ICU. Very well. Do we have the medical doctors to be able to cover? Do we have the beds to be able to sustain this type of, uh, of services? So here we already talked about triangulation, integration information within 
the same uh, the same type. Or, for example, try to understand. Okay, we have an HIV programs. Are we providing all the different services with for this program? How are we providing? Do we have enough uh, good coverage, for example, for the testing services? The knowledge should be present in every health facility. Um, the facilities that are offering, for example, the ER, uh, the ERV, where are they? Are we uh, are they well distributed or uh, or not? The viral load or the CD4 testing. And here is where we can have more. Yeah, more triangulation, more integration of information between the health facility attributes and the routine health uh, information system. And as well, gather more information, for example, uh, thanks to Scott and the maps uh, to try to understand it, what is the our coverage. So, for example, here what we are showing, all of these are uh, dummy data, are fictional, okay? So it's not representative for the, um, for the countries. But it's really to understand, for example, in this case, okay, we have uh, the HIV testing services, uh, but are we covering all the population? We know that it is a, a, it's an essential service, but are we covering all the population? So here where you can see that we are triangulating information coming uh, from the Google Health engine that are all the red dots, that is uh, the population distribution, the health facilities that are present, and the health facilities that are providing this type of service with a buffer of five kilometers. Normally, five kilometers what is considered accessibility to a uh, high health facility. It's not really a catchment area, but mostly. And uh, so here we can see, okay, we have uh, some part of the population that is not covered by these uh, uh, test services. Well, then we can use this type of information and try to see, okay, maybe in this area, do we have an increase uh, incidence of this type of pathology, et cetera, et cetera. Or as well here, another example of how we can use the population distribution. In this case, for example, by type of human resources, we have nursing and midwife, and the population is uh, all the uh, potential perennial attentive women that they need to have access uh, to this, uh, to antenatal care, or as well safe uh, delivery service with a B monk or a monk. And here we can see, it's fictional, but not that fictional sometimes, we can see that there are a, a very large group of population that doesn't have an access to this type of, of, uh, of services. And here as well, for example, another one for staff allocation. See, for example, medical doctors, where are they situated? Uh, should we maybe start to see, okay, we should redistribute this to have, uh, to increase the coverage of this type of, uh, of, uh, of service uh, for the world population. So here are just examples of how this information coming from the attributes of the health facility can be used and should be used to inform um, to inform policy for uh, for different programs. Uh, or here as well is a little bit uh, advanced, but here, for example, we are seeing this specific for another toolkit, the sensory function for uh, A-care. We are seeing, for example, that uh, is, uh, is a composite uh, indicator in which we have uh, the number of consultation by consultant. And this sometimes can be used, uh, sometimes used, for example, in emergency, try to understand, okay, the, the quality of care that we are providing is enough or no? Because for example, if uh, a consultant then needs to, uh, needs to do 100 consultation in eight hours is different from the quality is going to be different from what they can do 20 consultation in uh, four hours. Okay, so as well, here we have a, a clearly type of triangulation between information coming from the routine health information system, so number of consultation and the amount of staff or specific position, specific profile of uh, this staff. So as a summary, so what are the health facility attributes are these semi-permanent information that are collected at the health facility level that needs should be integrated in the routine health information system to allow this type of uh, triangulation of, uh, of analysis. And as Victor was saying, we invite you uh, on uh, tomorrow after four in the audit in this main, uh, same auditorium that we are going to kind of share a little bit of our experience on the production and the use of this uh, uh, global toolkit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefano, for sharing more information about this. So we've seen a bunch of. Uh, of examples out there of what countries are doing and also what we are doing uh, 
uh, also global level a little bit. Uh, we do have some time for, for Q&A. So I was wondering if uh, in the meantime, uh, someone got some interest sparkled. So uh, I will try. We have. You're just speaking here, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my, my question is about this triangulation with the products, the supply chain. It's two things. One is, the, does any of you have some saying around triangulation between the uh, the HMIS data and the supply chain? Like, I mean, all donors always ask, does our products end, does, or ministries ask, does the products actually end up at the health facility? Does that match? The disease level, right? It's a very common issue discussed. Any uh, experience on that? That's one question. The other one is, is what's really interesting is, I mean, if you can predict the level of malaria cases, which I think the example from Zimbabwe was about, if you can predict that reasonably well, you could actually start uh, setting the parameters and the distribution after that so that you have higher stock levels of the products at those facilities where you can predict there will be more malaria, and then in some other, other places you use less stock levels. That's so it's like so you can start linking things together like that. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna start like uh, collecting more questions if there are questions before I leave the floor to answers. Anyone else with questions? Okay. Doing it as fast as possible without dying. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Derek Musoka. I am a statistician with Ministry of Health in the M and E unit. Um, the, the second presenter I had. Uh, uh, thank you for that good presentation. I was linked more on the bit of the behavior approach. Uh, we are looking at DHIS to being our core with or without uh, donor support because it's already open source. So as we are looking at the study, as looking at uh, the sustainability bit, um, but also the behavior um, and also leveraging on the structures that we already have, because many a times we come here and do all these presentations, yet without um, donor support, you will not sustain whatever we intend to do. So that is why I was really focused on that bit. So please, could you respond to those? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. I'll do one last one before starting with some answers, and then we can do another round if we have time. Uh, hello, good morning. <laughs> I am uh, Adunil de Kiar from Saudigitus, and I'd like to ask for the last presenter uh, if uh, this triangulation from the health facilities, if it's uh, about all type uh, of uh, health facilities and services, because in uh, some African countries, we have services uh, available from uh, uh, community workers, for example, and we have a, a different kind of health facilities. So uh, according with the level of um, uh, medicine and the level of health service that we are providing. So if these health facilities, it's all about all type of health facilities or if are specific, that can be important for the policy makers and decisions. Okay, very last one. Okay, I cannot say no. I'm terrible. Okay, thank you. I, I would like to appreciate all presenters. Uh, maybe my question is for the last presenter uh, during the triangulation of uh, DHIS routine data with uh, a facility assessment. How how did you pull the data to to, to together? Maybe if that is possible one and the second one is uh, is there any threshold because uh, given that you know the health facility assessment is more sampling uh, sampling method and then the, the routine health information system is you know administrative we, we know that you know the result from the 
uh, facility assessment and then uh, routine might not be equal in the nature of the sampling. So is there any threshold to triangulate that one? And that's my question. And maybe for the second presenter, um, uh, about the um, using DHIS uh, for app for data, is that you are just suggesting to use for the data collection or for the analysis, given that you know some uh, analytic part like regression and other might be missed in the case of DHIS2, whether it, there is any possibility to incorporate that one in the DHIS2. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we do have some questions. Wait a second. First, let me answer. Otherwise, if I start forgetting, I get that. So I will leave you just a second. OK. OK, thank you so much. Uh, I think I will start to, to respond to the first, uh, the first person who, who, who asked in terms of uh, what we are actually doing in terms of when we predict that this area is going to have so many cases and in terms of logistic supply for, for, for in terms of for logistic supply for, for, for medicines. Yes, we, we also rely on that in terms of that data, but there is need also for improvement. We can't safely say we are doing that is as, as a way of responding to outbreaks. But uh, generally, we we also try to, to use uh, the prediction in terms of uh, logistic supply. Then uh, the second, second question was in terms of sustainability. Yes. So th this is actually being done by the Ministry of Health and uh, with support from partners. But basically, it is solely relies on the Ministry of Health to make sure that this thing remains sustainable. Uh, as we are speaking right now, even my, my director for MND is actually in here uh, to make sure everything, what we actually say is, is, is right. <clears throat> then in terms of for uh, uh, data, co uh, data collection incorporation to, into the DHIS2, so it's actually a recommendation this this app uh, in terms of climate change, and we have actually seen it being advertised, I think it was Tanzania, if I'm not mistaken, we have actually started to use the app. So we are also looking forward to say it would actually also be good for us to collect that data routinely instead of waiting uh, at the end of the year to say we are actually using the data by end of year. But if we do it routinely, it would actually give us an opportunity to make decisions properly and promptly and correctly without any delay. I thank you. Yes. I, I wanted to add something. Uh, Just otherwise so, it starts scratching. Oh, though, though not, not within my presentation about the, 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 the aspect of, of malaria and supply chain. Actually, we, we had a, a presentation yesterday. We In Tanzania, we managed to, to sort of uh, ensure the ordering of ALU is based on the number of cases around malaria. So what we have done, we have integrated the HMIS, the DHS2, uh, sending the malaria case data as per ALU specification, and the LMIS would control the next ordering of ALU based on the patients that have, have been received over the, the past two, two months. Of course, we are moving in a direction on, on expanding it to artesanate and other malaria related even uh, beside malaria. So I wanted to, to respond though it's not part of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I was just wondering on the side of uh, of uh, of supply and triangulation, if you had anything already integrated in, uh, in the HMIS when it came, comes to not only HIV, of course, but if you know more. So uh, regarding HIV, what we have uh, tried to do is like since in Tracker we record individual data, so we also like uh, prepared uh, the aggregated reporting from the sites about their, you know, ARB medicines uh, stock and how is already how much they have already received and how much they already consumed. But uh, since uh, there is also like in ELMI system is there. 
And so after like integrating those uh, reporting within Tracker, uh, we initiated it, but uh, the health workers, they have to, you know, the record the same data to the parallel or different system to LMIS and also to the HIV, since they are also recording individual level. Uh, though we haven't pushed them in like completely like to, you have to record it with in the system. But what our main challenge is like, whenever you, you know, match number of individuals on treatment with the resume, you know, the total resume and the side, it doesn't match always. So uh, due to that reason, we thought to integrate uh, the logistic uh, uh, reports, forms of formats of 10, you know, aggregated ones so that we can match with uh, the individual patient details they reported from the site. So, so we integrated it and, and they are like, it's not fully uh, used, but we have integrated it within the tracker by developing separate uh, reporting forms. Thank you very much. And uh, there were some questions uh, on uh, the HFA. So I, I will start with the one with the, with the logistic. I mean, yeah. <laughs> triangulation, logistic, and medical is essential because uh, as you were saying, for example, calculated forecasting for, uh, for example, for malaria drugs, for malaria con uh, consumable, if you're going to calculate only based on your uh, monthly consumption, uh, in maybe a malaria seasoning peak is coming, then you will be very short. Also, it's very, it's very neat to have this kind of a consideration. Can be, for example, malaria. Can be, for example, respiratory disease. You always need to take. Okay, mm -hmm. we we for the next. Uh, um, commands that we need to do, we will enter in the rainy season, we start the malaria peak. So of course, this needs to be taken in consideration, absolutely. And um, um, answering for uh, the Saudi uh, digital uh, question related to the type of uh, of uh, health facility, at the moment, the toolkit that we have uh, uh, is not really structured, structured to collect information for big health facilities, okay? So it's been very focused for primary health care. But, doesn't mean that can be used for other type of health facilities. Okay, we have um, we pilot this toolkit in Uganda, and this one was uh, was one of the feedbacks because sometimes when you have a secondary tertiary healthcare facilities, true that uh, maybe you need to collect this information not only for the health facility but service by service because you need to have the these details. So. I mean, as we all know, the HSC is very customizable, so you can really change. But it's really what we just really try to um, to put in the toolkit is the concept that this type of information are very key informations. So we structure in this way, but doesn't mean that it cannot be structured in another type of, uh, of information. We decide to follow this uh, HHFA type organization. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs> is to be discovered tomorrow at four. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. I'm sorry, Stefan, it's because the time is up and I also don't want to steal time from, from the next session. Once again, thank you so much for coming here today and, uh, and discovering more about integrated data analysis and triangulation. We hope it was helpful. You've seen our, our presenters. Feel free to, to corner them in the corridors. And, uh, and once again, thank you very much. And if you want to know more about other toolkits, tomorrow at four here. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>